Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of DeLorean Tech, and here we are at the 40th anniversary of the DeLorean Owners Association. So we've got quite a few DeLoreans here, and we're gonna go through them all. I don't know everybody who showed up, and I'm not quite sure how many we have here, but here's a pretty cool 81. Uh, here's Danny Botkin's personal DeLorean. Uh, it's a, an automatic early VIN 81 and it's completely stock as you can see so this is a pretty nice example here we have christopher hogard's car from delivering the dream part one as always and it's looking really awesome he's got it on the kw suspension here we have Derek kempsel and he's got his october 81 uh -huh. okay but you have the flat hood on it yeah okay but it is an 81 then it all is, right yeah. nice nice so we've seen this car before so <laughs> tell us what you've done with it man what's the latest stuff uh, nothing too much recently. Of course, I got the um, DeLorean Tech. Oh yeah, that's Clear looking lights good, right man. Down it's here. looking good. It's looking good. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got Octane LEDs here. Nice new paint. Oh the, yeah, uh, that looks great. Here. Man. This is the uh, Jeep touch. Mineral Gray. Yeah, it looks right really there. good. It looks good. Really good. Interior um, vinyl here to hide the headliner, oh, so you yeah. don't see it. I like that. I like that a lot. Machine rims. Oh yeah, the machine now, huh? Dude, very cool. And here we are with David Daniels How's and going? Scrap Steel. How's it going, man? Good. How's the Dynamat? Really good. Is it it super quiet? Great. Yeah, very quiet. Cool. Yeah. So somebody had a question. Sure. I'm so glad you're here. Okay. They wanted to know if it, if it helped with the smell of the car on the inside. Absolutely helps with the smell okay. of the car on the inside. That's, That's why I did it. Yeah, the smell <laughs> is so much better because you can't smell it. I'm still working on pulling some pieces out because there's the hump there in the carpet. Yeah, yeah. And then there's like a little bit on the top of the pad of the dash and stuff. So I'm working on some of that now. But it was like 100% improvement. Much, awesome, much better. Man. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. dude. Yeah, Thanks you're for welcome. coming. Yeah. And here we are with Alan Daniels. He's the original owner of of scrap steel and he's got his DOA car here and he is DOA member number 30, 30. which is a super early number probably one of the earliest yes uh, surviving numbers, numbers right hey I'll congratulations yes, sir thank you so we have another 81 here I'm not sure whose car this is a lot of people showed up today so there's a lot of new owners and stuff that uh, have come and we're gonna go ahead and see if we can meet some of them so here's Skip Vaughn's car, early VIN 81, VIN 808. So we have the DeLorean Tech car, as usual. Here's Ken McMillan's car. This was actually recently unwrapped. So this was one of the Apocalypse DeLoreans here. And as you can see, none of the uh, white stripe came off from that job. <laughs> At least, hopefully it didn't. There's a little bit of issues here, but that could have already been there. So, yeah, looks really good. And here's Gordon Carpenter's car, sexy two-door, sexy as always. He's got the really bling stuff going on in the engine compartment here. Got a stage two, chrome all over the place. Very nice car as always. So we have Tim Enger's car here, very cool 83. He just put a new kind of special radio interface here where he can actually control the original radio along with a Bluetooth setup that he's got hidden behind the rear wall. And here we see Richard McMillan's car. So he is doing his headliners right now. How's it going, man? Were you finding some weird stuff in there or what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty crazy, man. Look at that. So he's doing his Zodiac. headliners. Yeah. I wonder what's in there. Oh, look at that. It's oh, nasty. nasty. It's okay. I don't know. These are, I think these are original. So Dustin Hennig. There's Dustin. What's up, Dustin? How's it going, man? How's it going? Okay, so where's uh, the Marty thing, man? We gotta, gotta get that going. All right, all right. A little bit later. All right, cool. So Dustin's 81, very early VIN 81. We've seen this car many, many times at these events here. Oh yeah, I like that. That's a, that's a very cool. Where'd you get that shirt? Uh, I found it on Etsy. Okay, cool. I thought I'd be cheeky. Yeah, I like I it. I appreciate the history. I like it a lot. Right? No, it's very cool. Free DeLorean for sure. We got Paul Nye's car here as well. So Paul Nye, as you know, he's got a Back to Future. DeLorean time machine. He's got everybody's signature in here, and I think he's gonna get Kevin Pike to sign it today. I don't think he's got that done yet. So he's got everybody's autograph, which is really cool. He's got everything you can imagine in here going on. So lots of stuff. It's a Back to Future Part Two car. So he's got Mr. Fusion, and he's got the uh, kind of light-colored flux capacitor in there, as you can see. And this is Ryan Shanahan's car, AKA Engineer Skinny. So he just put the KWs on it. It looks really awesome. He's got the, uh, let's take a look. So he has 
the Wolfgang Hank Black Edition. KW is on here. So it's a pretty nice looking car here. Yeah, so he's got that DMC and the dash going on. That's pretty cool. And he's got this Pioneer head unit. I don't know if that's new or not. That looks pretty cool though. So this is, he's got a lot of cool little upgrades going on here. Very nice. So here we see Danny Botkin and we're going to open up the engine here. And go ahead and turn the key on to where the lights are on the dash, but don't start it. <laughs> but don't start it. Don't start it. Don't start it. So we are doing a tech day here. Please don't start it. Okay. It looks like it's in gear to me. Yeah. Oh, it's in gear. <laughs> Should I turn it further? Uh, just turn it on when the lights are on the dash. Second position. Sorry, that's there it. you go. I just heard it prime. Yep. So Danny, what do we got going on here, man? Just checking his vacuum solenoid for okay. the timing. Okay, okay. Cool. Because he's complaining that this doesn't have the power he used to. And if this vacuum solenoid is not working, you're only going to get half as much timing as your timing advance on startup. Got it, got so it. So I just want to check that. It is working. Okay. This little micro switch right here. Controls that vacuum solenoid back there. Nice. And that's where when you go take off, it advances timing so you get a little more oomph when you drive. Got it. So, but that's working fine. This little switch here, like I was just telling him, mm -hmm. you can just go like this and click on it. Yeah. And that's working. You're, you're going to get the 20 degrees advance. Okay. Uh, the only way to check the 20 degrees centrifugal advance is to get it running with the timing light. Right. Okay. But that, so, that seems to be doing okay. That's working. Okay. So, good. You seem to be fine there. Another way to check, you know, like if you're having an idle problem, you always check your idle speed motor. Mm -hmm. You turn the key on to just the red lights. Feel this right now, you can feel it. If it's buzzing. It's, it's buzzing for good. sure. Yeah. yeah. That tells oh, you yeah, the motor's doing sure. its job. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. That's cool. 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 Well, can you believe this? Can you believe can you believe this? <laughs> Forty years. Forty years that the DeLorean Owners Association is here. Yes. And you know why? Because of you, our DeLorean owners supporting it historical and just you know we keep, we keep doing what we're doing so so great to be a part of it and I'll tell you this event right here uh, I just can't thank Skip and Patty Vaughn opening their place to have this celebration because that's where the DeLorean Owners Association started it started at Ed and Millie Bernstein's home and brought in five couples basically and Okay. That's how this whole thing got started. And 40 years later, here we are. Todd, thank you very much for all that you do for the DeLorean community. No Thanks, and Robert. everyone who services these cars, support these cars, and keeping these cars on the road, that, my friend, you are a hero. All right, so we finally got the headliners off. Look how terrible they look. It would go like but that. let's just take a look at what it looks like underneath here. So you can kind of see the edges already right there. Let's take a look at this. Oh, man. All right, so there it is. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to get some new headliner material for this. You can see the, uh, the wiring for the doors come up there. The door lights, rather, and the dome lights. All right, so here's Dustin. He's working on his binnacle. What are you doing, man? I uh, just replaced the circuit board. This piece. Okay. I had an at home solution. Okay, cool. For a clipped uh, connector. Okay. But so now. Got I'm a not... new one in there. Yeah. Replace the new one. It's just a matter of putting it back in the car. So if I need something to do with my binnacle, I can call you up, right? Because <laughs> I've never taken mine out. <laughs> Let's take a look at this here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we actually put the speed box. In Dustin's car, I don't know, it was a couple years ago, right? At least, yeah. maybe three. I can't even remember now. And it's still there. Okay, good. Yeah, there it is down there, the speed hut. So you can kind of see that right there. And so, without any further ado, I certainly would like to welcome a very prestigious individual. He was a huge part of Bob Gill's uh, movie. Um, he is the construction coordinator for the Back to the Future time machine. Let's give a big warm welcome to Mr. Kevin Pike. Thank you very much for having me, everybody. Um, you ask how I might have gotten here? Well, Dustin drove me. <laughs> um, he's very kind of him to do that. He, he came to me and said, hey, if you're going, then I'll pick you up. I said, well, I live way up in Pine Mountain now. He goes, well, I'll pick you up at your son's house, and then we can go together. So that's how I got here. 
Um, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just some some history and uh, just relevant. Um, I was born back east. I was born in Hartford, Connecticut, in '51, and um, I went to school there. And then we moved up to the country in the suburbs. I was raised in Granby, Connecticut, and um, my, my goal was to be in drama somewhere, somehow. I was president of the drama club, the camera club, things like that. I always had an artistic side. I acted in the plays. And, enjoyed that very much and uh, life got rerouted for a couple of years and I ended up on Martha's Vineyard and I was there when they first started to make a little movie called Jaws you know, you've heard of it, it's about a little shark that jumps out of the ocean and sinks a boat and eats a guy <laughs> and I ended up being a local hire on that for about six months starting right from the very beginning of that after they brought the sharks out and uh, I learned a lot they asked me to come out and I did in November of 1974. I lived in Sherman Oaks, mostly the valley, most of the time. And I ended up working at the studios. I started at Paramount, got my 30 days in the Union, making sharks for a show called Islands in the Stream. And I ended up doing a lot of the TV work, was at Universal at the time, Bionic, and Six Mill, and Nancy Drool, and Hardy Boys, and things like that. And uh, learned a lot, and um, they liked having me. And I kept getting good opportunities. Then I ended up doing a movie of the week, which is a spin-off of a BJ and the Bear show. That was my first movie of the week that I did by myself. And then I got jobs on features, and little features, and then bigger ones and bigger ones. And then I got asked to do a show called Back to the Future. And I went over and met with Bob and Bob, and Stephen was there. Larry Paul, the art director, production designer, was there at the time. And I had read the script. I was really good about weaseling a script out of the production coordinator saying that, well, I have a meeting tomorrow with the director and he wants me to give him a breakdown. Can I come in and get a script? And they would give me the script and I had to leg up on the competition because I knew the story and I, I could ask questions about things that were germane to the story. And I realized right away that the car was the biggest star in the movie. And I had a relationship with Steven on several pictures and I knew that he was very sensitive to the privacy and confidentiality of the show. And so I said, well, I'd like to build a car. And they said, well, we're not sure how we're going to go in that direction yet. And I said, well, if I can't build a car, I don't want to do the movie. And it was like, what? Well, I had previously done a movie called Last Starfighter. It was a big show for me at the time, and I learned a lot. And I fell down a lot, but I got up. And they had a car in that movie that was built by Gene Winfield out in Mojave. And um, the, he gave Lorimar everything that they paid for, let's put it that way. But when it was on the set, they always wanted more out of the car. And I couldn't do anything. I didn't build it. I didn't know anything about it. And I felt like I was babysitting something that I was in the blind about. I didn't want that to happen on Back to the Future, because I realized how big of an element in the story the car was. And if I was going to be on the set and the car was there and I couldn't do anything, I would feel awful. So I kind of put my feet down and I said, I'd like to build a car. And I think they ran it up to Stephen and Stephen came back, well, okay, but you can't do it on the lot where everybody can take pictures of it. Because he didn't like it when people took pictures of the shark or E.T. or things like that. So we found a shop very close to Universal. It was the closest industrial zone in the valley. And it was very convenient for them to come over and take a look at our work from time to time. So I was the special effects supervisor on Back to the Future, and our crew at Film Tricks in North Hollywood built the DeLorean time machines for Back to the Future. We had about 20 guys that worked on it for almost 10 weeks straight. We built three cars. We had an art director coordinator that would go back and forth between what sketches we had from Ron Cobb, who I worked with on Last Starfighter, and um, Andy Probert, who I'd worked with on Star Trek. So we got sketches. We never had blueprints. People still ask me, can we get the blueprints for how you did it? Well, it was a creative collaboration of a lot of minds uh, with some leadership from Michael Chaffee that was very good aesthetically that this part would look good here. Okay, well, it can't go there because this is here and it would screw up the electronics or X, Y, Z. But basically, we had a bunch of hands-on people that were very creative in every way, because we all knew how to build props and make stuff like this. And 
every day I engaged with the crew on what was getting done, how it was going, and how it was looking, and how we could do it, because I was the responsibility to see that the end result worked through. Then when we got to shooting, there was a time, let me stop, there was a time when we got the news that Stephen wanted to see the car. Okay, fine. So we loaded it up, we brought it up to uh, Courthouse Square. It was nighttime then, and he came up from his Hamlin office on the golf cart, Bob and Bob were there, <clears throat> and he wanted to see every single light button, <laughs> push, lever, anything that on it could move, and he had the script. And he knew all the story points in his head because he's such a great filmmaker. And he said, I want to see what happens here. Okay, dot, 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 dot. And then this could happen here, dot, 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 dot. Okay, where's the lever that makes the car go dead? Okay, here, clunk, you know, things like that. He went through every single piece. And as soon as we were done, he goes, let's shoot. And so right away we got put into the calendar and we started shooting right around Christmas time between 84 and 85. Um, and we had done the A car, which had everything. We had a B car, which you know didn't have an interior at the time. We'll never see inside. It's just for shot, shots and, and driving shots and stunt work. So the first day they had that on the set, they said, we're gonna need an interior inside the B car. I got a great idea to bring them both back to the shop and we'll duplicate them side by side. Well, we don't have that time for that. Okay, well, how can we figure that out? Well, we'll give you pictures. So in those days, they had a still photographer on the set that was always equipped with a continuity camera for his wardrobe or whatever. And so we got Polaroids of the inside of the A car to match to the B car. Okay, where does this work? How does this work? And then they wanted it to operate. So Bill Klinger, our electronics genius, and he outboarded a controller with thumb wheel drives at the time that he could just do the camera perfectly. He was responsible for making the stopwatch tick over that one second. <laughs> and the producers were so, the unit manager was so difficult to deal with all the time. He said, well, you only need one digit to tick over. So Bill just made that one digit go from, I think, zero to one or something. And um, so there was, there was challenges like that with it. A lot of you with the people that put lights on your car, you have these neon LED tubes or something like that. We had white phosphorus gas, 5 8 <laughs> diameter glass. So you can maintain all that glass through motion picture shooting. It's pretty tricky. We had chicken wire frames with all the labels of all the pieces of all the glass triplicated. So if ever somebody leaned against it and broke it or anything like that, boom, hurry up, you know, turn it off, turn it back on, wham, here's your lights, start shooting again. So we had a crew that did nothing but maintain the DeLoreans on the set for the most part. Um, and then we had the C car, which you know was done for process photography. And we kind of chopped it up like sausage from the back to the front. <clears throat> and we would shoot through this window that was not there, which is an aluminum bulkhead on most of the replicas, as if it was glass and the camera could get right behind Marty so we could see Marty's reaction to things on the windshield in front of him. We had a rear screen process, which is where they project a movie on a screen from the rear while the cameraman takes a picture of it. So when that screen is lit up, the camera shutter is closed. And when the camera shutter is open, the movie has got a blank slate. So if you're looking through it as the cameraman, if you see an image on the rear screen, you're out of sync. So all that has to get coordinated in distance and focal lengths and things like that. We had Marty and Michael J. Fox in the car, and um, we shot a great deal of stuff on the stage, rocking and rolling, shaking, and then atmospherics and dust and everything go by. You might remember when he goes into the field at the farmer's yard, and he runs into the scarecrow. Well, that was done on the stage. He wasn't driving anywhere. We had a ram and a track that brought the scarecrow to the windshield and then blew up off an air ram and landed on the windshield with a flypole with monofilament that could jerk it off along with wind and, and, and dust and you know, grain and straw and stuff like that. We, we did a lot of work like that. Um, so that was an effective prop to have that sea car. And that, that did, we did a lot of good things with that. So then they had full dash, everything, all the lights in it, everything like that. And then we could shoot backwards, we could put that bulkhead back in and, put in what we call a Christmas tree. You all call it different names now, but I liked it because it looked like a Christmas tree to me. But it was there to signify speed. 
So you could look at Marty and figure out that the car was going faster because of the lights that were going. So we liked that effect a lot. Now when we looked forward, of course, you know we had issues with the speedometer only going to 85. At the time there was a, a law that speedometers in cars couldn't go faster than 85 technically. So if we put that label there, maybe they'd think to drive slower. So we had to send that out to the sign shop. We took the dash all apart, took it out, and they just kind of bumped all the integers up a little bit, made it work for us. But all those dials were under our control, and um, everything... <laughs> it's Einstein, I think. <laughs> Does anybody have a dog food machine that works automatically? We made that dog food machine to work automatically. <laughs> It worked, and the, the can the can of food dumped out and flopped in the dish. The day before Is the we dog's shut. Name Aria? Mario. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Fans are everywhere. Uh, okay, I'll be right there. Uh, so the, the whole idea was on the dog food machine. Even though we got it to work perfectly, you could just press a button, it would make the can drop, go to the can opener, turn around and flop into the dish. And the day before, legal came through and say, we don't have Brand X, which I think was Alpo, so you're going to have to go with something else. And they gave us CalCam. And if you open up one or the other, whichever one we ended up with, it doesn't come out. So we literally had somebody underneath the machine with a blowtorch, a rosebud, heating up the dog food in that can so when it turned over on cue, it would plop out. So that, that was another series of events that were miraculous that they got on camera in one take like that. So you never know what you're going to get thrown at. There was a lot of times when I fell down and got back up and went back to work and made it all work. There's a lot of work in Back to the Future. And I know that people appreciate it. It's a G-rated film. It's on TV every day somewhere. <laughs> Just so you know. I don't get any residuals. It was work for hire, but we're very happy that we did the job. And after 35, 38 years now, um, people still like it, and I'm still pleased to be honored because I made a contribution to all your family. That's it. Thank you, sir. If you have any questions. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is always something I was curious about. In the mall scene, when Marty's driving, he's got the radiation suit on. He's not, he's not, there's no driver's seat in the car, like he's sitting on a box to show off the, the electronics behind him. Is that true? Did you guys do that? It might have. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was crazy, because I was like, for sure he's no, not in a seat. No, it, it, it I'll depends. show you the scene. It's it, all, it all depends. <laughs> he must have been sitting on an Apple box. You, you do whatever you have to do to make the camera make everything look good, right? Yeah. We had a dog in the seat, and we had a guy in the seat with a customer, right? <laughs> and there's all different tricks that you need to use to make it work, so... Um, happy to do it. While I'm here, before they haul me off, Nobody's questions. Nobody's hauling you off. Hauling you off. Everybody gets to ask questions. Let me say another thing. If you have pictures, you can send them to me. And if you have questions, you can always write to me or call me. I love people. I love talking to people. I live alone, so it's always fun. <laughs> That's another story. Um, but it, it's, it's nice up where I live. It's quiet. I live in Pine Mountain Club. I know that's 6,100 feet, and there's not a lot of noise. I was able to write nine scripts during the quarantine. Wow. And they're winning contests. I, mean, I have 19 first place wins with one of them. So, call your agents. Call so, if you have any questions, please let's answer them right now so everybody can hear the answers. Go ahead, Paul. Oh, so, Kevin, in the, uh, knowing that you have to do retakes sometimes, and that that first scene being the way it was, how many people were back behind each one of those clocks, and how hard was that when they said, cut, we're going to do it again to get those clocks all set? Here you go. So they gave us a big pile of clocks, set dressing, came in, dumped all these clocks. Here's clocks for the lab. And so we thought, we don't know which ones they're going to use, but we were told they're going to be a lot of, a lot of clocks, right? So we made them all work, because some of them worked and some of them didn't. Oh, well, that's good. The ones that work, you can wind them up and they work. And then the ones that they don't, you have to get a little wire to pull the pendulum. Or the hard ones to reset were the alarm clocks that you had to wind all the way around and let all the digits flap and flap and flap. So all of those had to be set at the same time. And so the ones that worked had to be held in abeyance until they called action. 
And the other ones we had to motivate to move so that they looked like they were. And then when they called cut, you had to reset them. Some of them you had to go around front and do them by hand, and others you could do something from the back, right? So we had all the people on the clocks, probably about 10, maybe, wow. that could fit together in that section. We had somebody that made the toast pop up with the smoke. We had a guy underneath the camera lens with a little tray of smoke pellets, because it makes a pass, comes back, makes another pass. Right? So we had to make that tease in at the right time. We had the coffee to drip, so we had to mop that up or reset that every time, right? The TV had to go on. It had to be six, six, crystal synced at the time to be the 24 frames for the camera, right? And then we had the dog food machine, and then we had one cut, which was the close-up of the plop hitting the dish, right? Then you had to move over to see Michael open the door, throw the key under the mat to figure out how he could get in, and then kick the skateboard all the way across to hit the plutonium. That's in sync with the news article about the plutonium mm -hmm. species. That's one take. Wow. Everybody wow. perfect. Crazy. Everybody perfect. Okay, with a fluid head. Stephen was on the set that day. We did it in three takes. Wow. A lot of people working together, making movies. Mm -hmm. So that was a big deal. And it look, you watch it, it tells you the whole story. You're involved. And then you work over here and you see a speaker. Not just a little speaker. But it's a, we want a big speaker. <laughs> so we made that out of a, a, a mold, right, with chicken wire and plaster and a screen of the profile, a screed. And then we wound it around a pipe armature. We made the plaster and we brought in a truck with urethane foam, two-part urethane foam, which we had to dye with the proper chemical that we researched at the chemical lab so that when it broke, it didn't look white inside or, or gray, or excuse me, orange foam or something like that. It looked gray. And then we painted it and then we flocked it, right, so it had texture to it. And then we routed it out and we put in Primacord to break that speaker open. We put a metal comb behind there as a plunger to help it. And then above, we had all the lights and dials mounted. And then we had two air movers up there that you're not familiar with, but they're focused air fans without blades. And when you hit the solenoid, it gives you the burst. So we had debris and stuff up on top. And then on the tables, on the side tables, we had table wipes. And that's like a cable that you pull back and you well, it, it's uh, under stress for bungee cords, right? And you put it in a solenoid with a pyrotechnic trip on it, on both tables. Plus we had auxiliary fans and auxiliary smoke standing by. And then on action, everything went off at once. And those table wipes took all those papers off and boom up into the air. The guys on a, a deal with a guitar, I got, him, I got Bob to put glasses on him because the explosion's this far in front of him, right? I'm recording the phone. And he goes back, flies through the air with the guitar and the cord to the amp, right? Make sure it didn't pop out. And then he lands on the pile of books. The bookcase has to come over, cut, get him out, put Marty in, put the books back on Marty, roll again, and he goes far out, right? With his glasses, right? The glasses ended up being a trademark in the shot, how far are you going, Mr. Oh, about 30 years, right? We shot that commercial after with a great advertising agency production company called R. Greenberg and Associates from New York that came out just to do that commercial and we shot all that. If you watch that where he's walking down with his sneakers and everything, everything glistens, on the, on the, yeah. it's all wet down, the thump, everything. And then when the car takes off at the end, well we did that on the stage with a camera coming back off of that to make it look like it was going forward. Mm -hmm. right? And then we had so much trouble with the fire because it was so windy. If you watch that commercial, the fire is leaning sideways, about 95 degrees, and then um, 45 degrees. And then the same thing with the exhaust, out of the exhaust vents. It was so dry out there, we couldn't get CO2 to make any effect. It was like the, the, the extinguishers are empty. So we had to go all the way in from, we were way out by the border or somewhere, San Bernardino. We had to go all the way back to like Palmdale or Lancaster and get liquid nitrogen in the middle of the chute out to the <laughs> desert to make that shot. <laughs> so that producer liked me so much for that win that I worked probably 20 commercials with that company. <laughs> that when I was in New York working for him, when we got the word that we could go see 
the premiere of Back to the Future in the Universal Screening Room, some office in Manhattan. That's where we saw it for the first time with a crew that was working in a commercial. They all had worked with me on Back to the Future. So it was quite a different experience for me. But it, you don't know what you need to do. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You have to think quick on your feet, which, well, God bless, that's my long suit. Because the production is time and money. You have to keep them going, keep them happy. And you can't win everyone. Because sometimes you go into the valley, you don't even know who the enemy is. You don't know if it's going to be the wind today or somebody's grumpy or or you're not going to have enough people or enough money or something like that. Or so a sailboat a, coming a, in the back. There's a sailboat coming into view and you have to wait. So it's a great business, but you got to have the integrity and the mindset for it. Otherwise, you won't survive. I, I did. I, I start my 49th year, April the 18th. I'm 72 years old in May, believe it or not. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? I, I could ask Go ahead. This Ron. is a new one. Um, recently, there was a barn find DeLorean, had only 10,000 original miles on it, that was found and sold, and then less than a week later at its new home, the new owners started drilling into it to make it look like it was from the movie. <laughs> Do you, or Bob Gale, or Steven Spielberg, ever worry that sometime in the future some purist about the DeLorean automobile is going to bang on your door and beat you up <laughs> for causing us to lose so many of these pristine, perfect cars that we would have all loved to have had? Or do you just care less? <laughs> okay, first of all, I've never driven a DeLorean. <laughs> I've never driven really? a DeLorean time machine. <laughs> I know that if it wasn't for the DeLorean time machine construction movie, how many would be here? How many fell in love with DeLorean? Okay, so how many <laughs> fell in love with DeLoreans after the movie, and how many yeah. were people that started when it was first when it first came out? I think all the younger generation would say the movie. Yeah. Okay. And most of the people yeah. would feel that way, honestly, yeah. because you can have a DeLorean, it looks really cool, and then you can have a time machine, it looks really, really cool, and what if we didn't build it? What if we used the Mercedes Gullwing 300? Like, SL. That was an idea for a minute. Until <laughs> so they did a price tag. <laughs> and they decided on the DeLorean. Well, they're having a fire sale on those right now. And they all agreed, okay, DeLorean it is. Teamsters, go get us three DeLoreans. And they came into my shop like, like, like the DeLorean does sometimes when it comes back. And it was amazing. One was 18000 one was 15000 and the C car was 12000 And so we went to work cutting them up. Do I feel bad that people drill in the car? Well, no, because I know you can heliart that all back together and sand it and get it back to beauty and turn your car back into a street regular DeLorean if you'd like. Um, I think you get more cluck for your buck with a, with a replica. But I'm fond of it, you know? All right, anybody else? If you have any other questions, you can always email me and ask me. Go ahead, sir. I have a question. Tell me your name first. Oh, my name is Chris. I haven't met you personally. Chris, thank you for coming. Absolutely. Pleasure to meet you. Um, you said the Teamsters picked up the three DeLoreans. Now, because the DeLoreans are kind of different, you know, like early 81s are different than later 81s, but you guys picked all three identical cars, like the grooved hood, the to door the best ability. The C car was uh, automatic. Okay. So we had to be careful about that. Got it. Right. So were the guys aware, like, okay, cool, like, we need to make sure they all have grooved hoods or no. these and I don't by think, luck? I don't think that the Teamsters had, not, not that they were dumb in any way. Sure. I mean, they're wizards at finding things. Yeah. But there is those nuances that are different. And, okay, well, we don't have these two exactly alike or whatever. So we made the C car the oddball that we could cut up. Yeah. And then the, the A and the B car were really pretty much identical in every way. So did you guys just put like the manual boot on the automatic shifter so it looked... We just avoided shooting it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to shoot your mistakes sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love you all very much. Okay, Thank keep in touch. Comments. Let's give Kevin a big, big hand because just like what he said, okay? Without what he has done, without tricks, without what he has done as a special effects creator, the car, the DeLorean, would be pretty much next to a Brickland.
it would be an orphan car. And we just congratulate you, Kevin, for what you have done, not just to the movie, per se, but to the, the entire DeLorean community throughout the entire world. I'm very honored. Thank you. You're very welcome. And part of that honor, uh, you are now a lifetime commemorative member of the DeLorean Owners Association. Here. I'll get to drive one something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want to drive my Kevin? The ever famous DeLorean it. Owners Association Can keychain. The honor. And then, of course, what I pass by pass to all of our board of directors is our commemorative DeLorean pen. Isn't that lovely? And then Skip has a special presentation for you. Thank you, bro. Thank you very much. Yeah. One of our one of our members yeah. one of our members years ago made uh, some DeLorean rings. Oh, no. oh, wow. yep. You see, there it is. That's a gold one. Yep. We have some Beautiful. Also. And uh, that's what it looks like. And a uh, guy named oh, Mel Romans. Perfect. A guy named Mel Romans made them. And uh, he lives in Chicago. You know my size. Hey, what can I say? <laughs> hey, I can't get it on my other face. <laughs> so I type all day, so that's why they're skinny. So enjoy. Please. I can tell already how much I'm going to enjoy. Thank you very much, Here, and thanks welcome. for having me to the celebration. Oh my God! Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Yeah. All right. God bless. Thank you, Kevin. Give a big hand, Kevin Pike. One more, one more thing. One more thing. Yes. Kevin. Kevin mentioned he, he's never driven a DeLorean. I'd like to change that today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Around the block, Kevin. Just so you can oh, yeah. <laughs> It's an automatic, it's not so it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your contributions, Kevin. Thank you so much. Like I said, without Kevin, without the team with the Back to the Future movie, the franchise, like I said, the DeLorean would not be in the status symbol as it is today. The DeLorean owners themselves throughout the world, thank you. We've got a ton of them in there. Every Tuesday, just change the world. Yeah. All right, this is me leaving. Thanks for everything. Thanks again, Kevin. Bye, Kevin. Thanks for coming, man. Bye, everybody. Thank you for everything. Bye, Bye girl. Thank you. So here we are, Gordon Carpenter's car. You gotta love this LED lighting. It's pretty badass. All right, so I'm gonna show you guys how Gordon Carpenter's lighting system works. So we've got this remote here, and depending on what you press, oh, look at that. So we got, oh, there you go. Purple, green, yellow, aqua. Looks like orange, purple, green ish. Another kind of color. You got like every color on this thing, man. This is awesome. Lots of colors. This is fun. So what does this do? Oh, look at that. Strobe light. Yeah, what does this do? Oh, there you go. Kind of like pulses. Pulses. And, it's and you can put it on rotating. Oh, nice. Oh, look at that. I got a lot of cool stuff going on here, Gordon. Look at that. That's neat. Look at that. It's like infinite like possibilities. <laughs> so if you're interested, this is called LED Glow, LED Glow. And you can search them up on the internet and see what they can do for you. Sounds good. So I'll work on that and report back. Yeah, report back because yours, <laughs> yours needs to start working. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the 40th anniversary of the DeLorean Owners Association celebration. We are just about to call it a night here, and this is Paul Nye's time machine all lit up here at night. It looks really awesome. He's got all sorts of LEDs going on here. Hope you all enjoyed the video, and once again, thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.